Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the National Museum of the United States Air Force. The ceremony will begin shortly. Please make your way to your seats and silence your electronic devices. Good evening, and welcome to the official opening of A Force for Good, Department of the Air Force Humanitarian Missions exhibit. My name is Jackie Heiss, and I'm one of the curators who worked on the exhibit we are all here to celebrate. It is my honor to be your Master of Ceremonies for tonight's event. At this time, we ask you to please stand as our distinguished guests are introduced and remain standing for the posting of the colors and the singing of our national anthem by Master Sergeant Kristen Foley. That our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the
Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Thank you to Master Sergeant Foley and to the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base Honor Guard. We are honored to have many distinguished guests in attendance this evening, both in person and virtually. Please know, as we recognize very few, we are most appreciative of the time and effort each one of you has made to attend this event. At this time, we welcome our speakers for the evening. As a reminder, please hold your applause until all introductions have been made. The commander of the Air, Material, Air Mobility Command, General Michael Minahan, pararescueman from Special Tactics Training Squadron, Hurlburt Field, Florida, Master Sergeant Kenneth O'Brien, National Museum of the United States Air Force Staff Curator, Ms. Sarah Sessions. In addition, distinguished guests in the audience include Commander of the 711th Human Performance Wing, Brigadier General John Andrus, Surgeon General of Air Mobility Command, Brigadier General Norman West, Director of the National Museum of the United States Air Force, Mr. David Tillotson, Acting CEO of the Air Force Museum Foundation, Mrs. Melinda Lawrence and her spouse, Mr. Mark Lawrence, President and CEO of the National Aviation Hall of Fame, Mrs. Amy Spowert, President and CEO of the National Aeronautic Association, Mr. Greg Principato. Representing Air Force Materiel Command, Command Chief Master Sergeant David Flossie and his spouse, Mrs. Katie Flossie. Representing Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Vice Director of the 88th Air Base Wing, Mr. Gregory Leingang. And of course, all of you who made it here tonight and those joining us virtually on YouTube. I'd like to take a moment to thank some of the organizations the exhibit team relied on throughout the exhibit development process. The Air Force Wildland Fire Branch, the Air Force Special Operations Command History Office, 24th Special Operations Wing, and various other special tactics operators, members of the REACH 725 Transport Isolation System Mission, the Air Mobility Command History Office and Surgeon General's Office, the 62nd Operations Group, the 711th Human Performance Wing, including the U.S. Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine and the Air Force Radiation Assessment Team, the 910th Airlift Wing, and the 123rd Special Tactics Squadron, Kentucky Air National Guard. Our exhibit would not have been possible without the time, expertise, and artifacts you generally provided. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a round of applause. At this time, please welcome General Michael Minahan to the podium. I'll take a pity applause. Thank you. All right. Happy Friday. Okay, don't say it back. Happy Tough crowd. Um, so Matt, Matt, my speechwriter, is here. Where are you, Matt? Raising his hand. It's a tough job because he writes this wonderful stuff, and then I do this to it. Um, all that to say, I'm just going to speak from the heart and not give a speech. Um, I think it's important that no matter how busy we are, that we're never busy or too busy to honor the awesome that surrounds us every day. Um, certainly extends to those on stage, um, heard the roll call of introductions and so many more that weren't. Um, to come after a, a blitz week, at the end of a long week, um, to sacrifice your personal time to get up here to honor uh, a family is really cool. To honor exhibit that honors the team that surrounds us, um, you know, we could never be too busy for that. So this, this is the absolute right thing. And we're surrounded by the monument uh, of valor, monuments of hope, monuments of the force for good, and those can come out in a couple of ways. You know, one, one way is it can come out in lethality, uh, which is a force for good when our fight flag and our fight song is at the front of it. And certainly in the humanitarian realm, uh, it's a force for good as well. So we'll celebrate that both past, present, and future. It's been an emotional day for me. I'm Irish. I'm not scared to cry in public. Um, you know, but my day started out in a B-26 cockpit down here, which I'd never been in before. But my inspiration to be a pilot started with my granddad, 
telling me war stories on the foot of my foot of my bed. You know, so I'm executing plan A. There was no plan B. Be a pilot in the Air Force. And to sit in his chariot today and to see the, the view he had out of the nose of that wonderful lady, uh, to somewhat connect to him was extremely emotional for me. And then this girl behind me, the battle herc, feels exactly the way she should, by the way. So if you want some ambiance, get in the cockpit and smell the awesomeness of the herc. Spray paint on the tail, dinged up, not polished, faded paint, bug marks, bird marks, and if you go to the other side of the cockpit, the entry wound where a mortar rocket came in and killed the flight engineer in the Vietnam War. And I had the opportunity to fly her here 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, and meet the aircraft commander on that mission and talk to him about what it was like to take off of a, a strip in Vietnam with a dead crew member on board and continue the mission. Honoring our past. But one thing I said during the interview when I landed was, as awesome as this place is, she don't want to be here. And as old as she is, she had more life in her. And it's true, she flew sweet to the field here. And I think she's great right now. But tonight's about Master Sergeant Ken O'Brien and his bride, Michael and Diana, the parents, and then Tom and Judy, the grandparents. We don't often get to honor three generations of service and celebrate more than one action uh, in front of an entire family tree that's pretty cool. And I hope I don't let you down tonight. As cool as all these airplanes and these monuments of valor are, they're not as cool as the people that fly, fix, and support them. And so they represent what can't be seen, what perhaps can be smelled on this one, which is the blood, sweat, and tears that make the mission go. An example of which I participated in today. There's a little white jet out on the flight line. There's a team in the back here that made my presence possible. There's a maintenance crew back at Scott that generated the jet. There's two pilots that went into crew rest last night. And there's a whole team ready to receive us on the other end. And that's just for a one hour ceremony. And each one of these airplanes has hundreds and hundreds of thousands of those stories that make them the monuments that they are. It's especially poignant that we're celebrating the Air Force's 50th, 75th, forgive me, she is young, 75th anniversary. And it strikes me that Air Mobility Command's history is the Air Force's history is America's history. And that our forefathers and our foremothers that paved the path and left giant footsteps for us to follow in are represented by these monuments too. Whether it's the Tuskegee Airmen or the WASP pilots or Gail Halverson, the candy bomber, whose recent admission to the ultimate high ground is looking down upon us right now, that we celebrate their, that we celebrate their spirit, their tenacity, and the culture that they ingrain in us, which is to not worry about if we're going to get it done, it's just going to worry about how we're going to get it done. A ter terrific example sitting on stage here. You know, so when we talk about hope and we talk about humanitarian, we talk about the force for good, this exhibit nails it. It could not be more poignant. And I'm grateful to the entire museum team that makes such a powerful statement each and every day from those who know it intimately to those who are learning it for the first time. Air medical evacuation represented in the back of the 
C-130. The transportable isolation system, which was so effective during COVID. The airdrop, the firefighting, there's parachutes coming down up there. And in those parachutes could be medicine, bullets, anything that can deliver hope, humanitarian, and force for good. I saw it firsthand in Operation Damian when we landed on the ramp at Taklaban and the ramp opened up and it was a sea of humanity needing America to be a force for good. Desperate to live. Begging for food, a ride, shelter, water. And it was the air mobility team, the broader air force, the joint team that could deliver that hope and be that force for good and follow through. Same thing not too much longer, not too much later in Nepal. To go into Kathmandu on the backs of our special operators, augment them with expert ground forces that can untangle an international airport in crisis and could make the path for humanitarian to get in there, critical medical care, food, water, shelter, hope, goodness, humanitarian. And then many years later, not too many years later, to go into North Korea in a C-17 and repatriate 55 sets of remains over 50 years after they were lost. Humanitarian, hope, goodness. Deliver on a promise that we will never forget and some were in the audience or on the flight line when we got back. And to open the ramp with 55 sets of flag drink containing American heroes, South Korean heroes, and have a wall of honor lined up on the Broadway, standing at attention from servicemen, service women, from every service to Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, our South Korean partners, humanitarian, hope, good. To what we saw in August in Afghanistan, 124,000 evacuees. fighting for a chance to be like us on our turf, on the backs of a joint team, on the shoulders of a joint team, on an air mobility team, on a special operations team, on an air force team, on a whole of government team that made hope, humanitarian, and good happen instantly. Two days ago, our command flew one KC-46 with one aero medical evacuation patent on board from Europe to the East Coast for one. Nobody else can do that. To get that soldier the critical care they need to live. Who does that? This team does that. Hope, humanitarian, force for good. So in a year where we celebrate 
75 years of air power, 75 years of air dominance, 75 years of delivering hope, 75 years of airmen and what it means to be an airman, to be different. Seventy-five years of the spirit of air power. Seventy-five years of traditions. Seventy-five years of legacy that make it all possible. That's this year. And this night we celebrate a force for good, a force for hope, and a force that is humanitarian. And we need no, to look no farther for it personified than right here behind me. We need to look no farther than the inspiration that will propel us forward in the next generation of airmen indefinitely. And so to Ken and Tiffany, to Mike and Diana, to Tom and Judy, thanks for raising a page some R-rated language here. Thanks for raising a badass. It matters. You know, when I, when I don't sleep at night, it's because I, I judge myself whether I'm worthy of airmen like him, whether I can keep up with people like him, and whether I can support families like you. He's got three stories, and we talked about it earlier. about whether he's in the right place at the right time or just happens to be there when things go wrong. What I've found in my 30 plus years is that when things go wrong and you look left and you look right, the right people tend to find themselves in that place. To the sound of the guns, they just happen to be there. Opportunities aren't luck, opportunities are made. And I was in Korea when he provided the life-saving measures during a car accident to pull somebody out of the burning wreck. I remember it distinctly. And we all watched your actions in Thailand and are amazed by your bravery, your tenacity, and your courage. And then I learned in prep for today, you also had an event on an airplane with a baby, a little resuscitation, okay? Baby's good. No doubt. All right, so I don't wanna be number four on your, your resume. All right, so if, if I go down tonight, someone else take care of me. I don't want to be number four. But I think it's an eloquent way to transition to his words tonight. Is that everything that these planes represent in this great museum, everything that's represented in our 75th anniversary, and represented in a force for good in these exhibits is personified by this wonderful airman right here, and I think we owe him a wonderful round of applause. Please join me. You ready? Just in case you missed the cue, that's your introduction. All right, okay, all good. right, man. Okay. All right. Appreciate that. Uh, just a disclaimer. I was not the only person in the cave rescue. I was also not the only one at the uh, burning fire, and I did have at least a little bit of help with that baby. So, just want to make sure. Um, so yeah, Mass Sergeant Ken O'Brien, pararescueman station in Herbert Field, Florida. I'm um, here to talk about an opportunity I had at the cave rescue in Thailand in 2018. Um, ended up being one of the most publicized humanitarian missions ever, and uh, most of you probably followed it. Um, very intently. Um, Pararescuemen and combat controllers are no strangers to humanitarian missions. We have some in the audience today that have also participated in these. Uh, but none of us could have imagined that we'd be tasked with diving in a flooded cave in northern Thailand uh, to save a bunch of trapped kids and their soccer coach. I'm here today to tell you briefly about that mission and how we were able to bring the story to life in the Force for Good exhibit. It all started on the 23rd of June, 2018, when 12 members of the Wild Boar soccer team and their coach went into the Thuong Luang cave system and were trapped by rushing floodwaters. Thai civilian and military forces attempted to locate the boys, but on the 26th of June, they reached out to other countries for assistance because of how complicated it was. 
On the 27th, the 353rd Special Operations Group uh, at Kadena Air Base, Japan, was tasked with the mission. The pararescuemen combat controllers from the 320th Special Tactics Squadron, pararescuemen from the 31st Rescue Squadron, C-130 air crews, and support personnel would be the team to go. By 0100 on the 28th, we were on the ground in Thailand ready to assess the situation. The cave waters were so volatile that diving operations were deemed too dangerous and we would have to assist elsewhere. The first few days were very chaotic, trying to figure out lines of effort and who was actually in charge. We spent those days in the mountainous jungle trying to find alternate entrances to the cave, saving a vehicle from tumbling down a mountain with a rope system, and establishing helicopter landing zones on top of the mountain. On 1 July, the water in the cave began to calm down and volunteers to start dive operations were requested. Three pararescuemen and myself volunteered to go first, and we'd have additional combat controllers and pararescuemen diving after us. We were tasked to work with the Thai, Australian, Chinese teams to position hundreds of air tanks and hundreds if not thousands of pounds of equipment into the third chamber of the cave. Only one of us had ever dove in a cave before, and we weren't really sure what we were getting ourselves into. Over the next two days, we successfully staged almost 300 air tanks and thousands of pounds of equipment into chamber three. These tanks were crucial to the ongoing search deep into the cave to find the boys in their coach. Late at night, the UK divers successfully found all 13 members of the wild boar soccer team in what would be known as chamber nine. As awesome as this was, we now had the weight of the world on our shoulders as we tried to figure out how to do something that had never been done before. Rescue 13 people trapped multiple kilometers back in a flooded cave. The next several days would be dedicated to getting food and water back to them and trying to figure out how we were actually gonna get them out alive. During this time, one Thai seal had a shot, shallow water blackout between chamber two and three and was successfully re resuscitated with help from myself and another pararescuman. Sadly, the next day, Simon Kunan, a former Thai SEAL who had volunteered to help, died diving between chamber three and four. These instances highlighted the dangers we were facing in the cave and the dangers we were facing in the rescue. A plan was devised to medically sedate the wild boars and dive them out of the cave, something that had never been attempted. An Australian anesthesiologist and world-renowned cave diver, Dr. Richard Harris, would sedate the boys and prep them for their journey. UK divers would transport the boys out with assistance from other international cave divers. At Chamber 3, US and Thai forces would take the boys the rest of the way out, utilizing rope rescue systems, a short dive between Chamber 3 and 2, and good old-fashioned manpower to carry them all the way out. My role as the primary medic in Chamber 3 was to assess the boys and the divers to see if they could continue their journey. We assessed that at least three to five of the boys would die during this operation, and if any of them survived, we thought it would be a success. It was either some would die or they all would die. Uh, next, the next three days, One second. Next three days were full of extreme stress, close calls, and a chamber reflooding. But we were able to achieve the unthinkable and rescue all 13 members. They are all alive and well to this day. When I practice this, this does not happen. Um, I'm very excited to be able to donate my equipment and be a part of building this exhibit to highlight my team's heroic actions. I will continue to try to highlight the heroic actions of Special Warfare Airmen. There are countless amazing stories of these airmen that few will ever hear about. I hope this exhibit helps us all remember what is possible when we are willing to put it all on the line to ensure someone's worst day isn't their last day. All the rescuers, and especially Simon Kunan, embodied the pararescue motto that others may live. Thank you for coming tonight.
Thank you very much, Sergeant O'Brien. Our final comments will be from a curator on staff and member of the exhibit team. Please welcome Ms. Sarah Sessions to the podium. Thank you very much. Um, while I, I get my comments out here, I'm just going to say that I have not rescued anyone. <laughs> and, um, but what an incredible story. I, I just have to take a moment to recover from that. <laughs> but um, I, I do want to say a welcome very much to everyone for being here. Thank you. Um, and thank you for joining us to celebrate an opening of a force for good. It is an honor to have you with us, and it's been an honor to work these past 18 months to create an exhibit that explores the Air Force's humanitarian mission. I'm going to take a moment and put my glasses on. <laughs> um, it's, it's a great subject and one that really resonates with our visitors because it's a human story. It's filled with drama and excitement and emotion. Uh, the exhibit presents a lot of stories, uh, some that I think that you will recognize. Others may leave you thinking, I never actually knew the Air Force does that. At its core though, we hope that the exhibit leaves you with a better understanding of how airmen use their training and their equipment and technology to help people in crisis, whoever they are, wherever they are. Now, of course, the Air Force does not do this alone. It works side by side with the other military services, state and local governments of the areas affected. Its, uh, uh, its partners also include countless non-governmental organizations like the Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, Save the Children, and United Way, to name just a few. Together, they provide aid and relief to communities in need that nobody else can reach. I wanted to take a few minutes tonight and give you the curator's perspective of the exhibit. Now, just like any humanitarian mission, an exhibit about humanitarian missions doesn't just happen. It takes the proverbial village to build. And so it started with an exhibit teams assembled back in the summer of 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic. Somewhat randomly and maybe a little serendipitously, I was placed with three of the most skilled, creative, and knowledgeable museum professionals I have ever worked with. My colleagues, Mitchell Dorston from the museum's exhibit division, Christina Douglas from our research division, and of course, Jackie Heiss, from my own collection management division, all brought talent and enthusiasm and passion to the project. And they also brought kindness and generosity and a true wingman's spirit. Oh, and, and they brought a lot of their senses of humor, which they needed, especially working with someone as ancient as I am. Full disclosure, I am the oldest one on the exhibit team by a wide margin. I started my career here at the museum when they were graduating high school and the second grade. Uh, one of the team's first challenges was artifacts. In a nutshell, we didn't have any. I mean, I take that back. We had 62 that popped up on a database search as being humanitarian related. They consisted of United Nations ration packets, uh, a couple of challenge coins, and some firefighting clothing from the 1980s. Not a very auspicious beginning. We knew we had to do some serious collecting, and we were on a tight timeline. So where do we start? Well, we picked up the phone and we started making calls. One of the first that I made was to Tim Brown, then the command historian at Air Force Special Operations Command, who listened to our concept and without skipping a beat said he was on board. A few months later, we were unloading a truck from the Special Tactics Training Squadron of the 24th Special Operations Wing, full of artifacts, many of which you will see in the exhibit. Next call was to the Air Mobility Command History Office. Again, Ellery Walworth and his team pointed us in some great directions, especially the 621st Contingency Response Wing. So I called Jamie and Parks, 
their wing historian, and just like that, I'm watching something called a hard side expandable light air mobile shelter, or helums, being offloaded at my front door. Wondering what a helums is? It's in the exhibit. AMC's Office of the Surgeon General was also instrumental in our artifact hunt. They made the transport isolation system, or TIS, available, and they even sent a team from their medical readiness logistics branch out from Scott Air Force Base to assemble it. There just did not seem to be anything that Randy Rogers and his colleagues couldn't find for us, including countless pieces of aeromedical evac equipment and lots of protective clothing, bags, filters, meters, tubes, straps, litters, even medical mannequins. And by the way, if you're wondering what the TIS is, well, it's right behind me. Um, we're also very grateful to Randy for putting us in touch with people right in our own backyard. If it wasn't for the airmen at the 445th Airlift Wings Aeromedical, Aeromedical Staging Squadron, who knows what the CCAT display that we've got inside the TIS would look like. Thanks to them, the right hoses are attached to the right machines, and no one will post on Twitter that we've killed our mannequin patient. Well, next was a referral from Wright Patterson's aerial port manager, who suggested that I reach out to Senior Master Sergeant Kevin Massey, his counterpart at the 910th Airlift Wing. I did, and it was the beginning of an incredible relationship. In, uh, in preparing my remarks, I, I went back to old emails, and I found the first one that I had with uh, Sergeant Massey, uh, in which he casually said, we can probably provide something for the airdrop piece of the display you guys are working on. <laughs> Truly an understatement. Um, working with the 910th, we were indeed able to figure out that airdrop piece, which you can see suspended near the beginning of the exhibit. What you can't see is the countless hours spent figuring out how to realistically deploy the airdrop bundles or all the extra support that the 910th gave us, including flight delivering the bundles. For them, it seemed like it was just another day at the office, but for us, it meant the world, and we cannot thank you enough. Finally, I, I want to give a big shout out to our friends at the 711th Human Performance Wing and their uh, Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine. We received incredible support from Elizabeth Miller, the Deputy Chief of the En Route Care Department, and her crew of nurses and respiratory therapists and medical technicians at USAF SAM. They helped get us smart about what we needed and then offered to make almost all of it available to us from old training equipment. And when they were finished donating artifacts, they donated their time and helped, with the, uh, helped us install the diorama that you'll see inside the C-130. They set up the litters, installed the equipment, ran tubing and wiring every which way. They even advised us on which way or which direction our patient mannequins' heads should be facing on the litter. I mean, who knew they were right or wrong way? Um, these real medical professionals even patiently posed while we bended and twisted our mannequin medical professionals that serve as stand-ins for them in the diorama. We learned so much from our USAF SAM friends and remain deeply touched by all their support for this exhibit. And finally, um, speaking for the entire team, I want to give a huge thank you to all the people that we interviewed as a part of our research process. When we started, we knew a little, a little about the Air Force's humanitarian mission, but we also knew how to get smarter, and we did in the same way that we gathered artifacts, by reaching out to organizations and talking to their people. Between November 2020 and May of 2021, we conducted 13 interviews with almost 30 people, spread across five different mag MAGCOMs, and perhaps the only COVID-19 silver, silver lining, the virtual worlds that we've been able to create on Teams and Zoom made these interviews possible and in some cases convenient. As long as we accounted for the time zone differences, we were able to talk to folks wherever they were, and in one case as far away as Italy. The information experience and personal perspective 
gleaned from these interviews was invaluable to us and, we, and can be found woven throughout the words and the pictures that you'll see in the exhibit. Of course, I could go on and on and on about the people and the organizations who help make this exhibit a reality, but I am mindful of the clock and that I am all that stands between you and the buffet table. So I'm just going to close by saying it was a privilege to work with so many active duty, guard, and reserve forces who carry out the Air Force's humanitarian mission day, day in and day out. Their work, your work, has profound importance and impacts countless people and their communities all over the world. You are there them at their most vulnerable, to rescue them, to heal them, to comfort them. I hope this exhibit captures some of that impact and gives our visitors here at the National Museum a better understanding of what a force for good you all really are. Thank you very much. Finally, in section on Operation Deep Freeze, we have a penguin on display. For the last month, the museum has had a contest to name the penguin. With over 20,000 votes cast, we would like to announce the winning name is... Waddles! Sorry, there was supposed to be a drum roll. It was going to be much more climactic. As we conclude the event, our audience is free to tour the museum until 9 p.m. and enjoy refreshments in the Space Gallery Overlook. The curatorial staff will be standing outside the exhibit to answer questions. We invite our virtual audience to the website for more information on the exhibit. Now, we invite all of our guests to join us in singing the Air Force song and the departure of our distinguished guests. too late. <laughs> Off we go. I think this exhibit is really important for people to see because it gives them a broader understanding of what the Air Force does. It's not all combat operations, and I think that's really important for people to realize that we're doing a lot of things in a lot of places around the world to help other communities, to help other people. And I think it's just important for people to see. I'm Jackie Heiss. I'm a curator in the Collection Management Division here at the National Museum of the United States Air Force. For the exhibit design process for humanitarian it started as an exhibit proposal. As we learn more, as the process develops, we can adapt and mold things to best suit the visitor experience. Hi, I'm Mitchell Dorston. I'm an exhibit designer with the National Museum of the United States Air Force. I think this exhibit will appeal to people, and I would invite people to come and see it because it is truly, at its very core, about People. It's about a very human experience. It's about people who are either in crisis or the people that are responding to people in crisis. And that's a very human 
um, story. I think there are a lot of aspects to it that people will, will relate to. There are things that they will recognize. There are stories they will recognize. I think most people walking through the exhibit will remember hearing about or reading about Hurricane Katrina. Um, many people will remember the earthquakes in Haiti. Many people will even remember stories and video footage from the Thai cave rescue. Um, so those things, I think, may serve to draw people in. Hello, I'm Sarah Sessions. I'm a curator in the Collection Management Division. The stories that we tell in the exhibit are tied very closely to the C-130. So that's why we chose it to be the backdrop of the exhibit. It was a natural fit. It's a great feeling to see these different people who've done these missions uh, bring their artifacts in. These are objects sometimes that are very special to those people, and it's an honor that they'll trust us to share those with the public. On other times, uh, in other cases, it's uh, something kind of mundane that they never expected would even be considered an artifact. The tractor plow is a good example where they, uh, they were like, oh yeah, we have one just kind of sitting out uh, in the yard. And we said, no, that's actually, that's perfect. This is an incredible way we could tell your story. And they were like, really? You're serious? Uh, so, you know, long story short, uh, now we have a tractor plow. And they're like, yeah, we have these tractors that we use, these fire dozers. We, we'll try to send you one of those, like laughing, joking. And then we're like, haha, yeah, no, really, if you have one, we're easier to deal with than DRMO, I promise. So it all kind of started just as like a little joke. And then a couple months later, we got an email from one of the people we'd interviewed. And they're like, hey, so it turns out down in Eglin, we actually do have one that they're ready to dispose of. Do you still want it? And we're like, yes. Yes, we very much do. Finally, July 2021, that truck rolled up with Tractor 53 on it. And I was so excited. I literally was jumping up and down just to know that we were, we were doing all this back and forth. We were thinking, okay, this artifact isn't gonna come. The tractor's huge. If it doesn't come, what do we do? That's a huge footprint that we now need to fill. So it was a lot of worry, a lot of concern, but then she showed up and it was great. So it's the Eglin Wildland Support Module. So they're a one unit. There are 12 support modules throughout the U.S. from the Air Force Wildland Fire Branch. So all the other artifacts that we got for that area, we have some fire tools inside of a case. Those actually came from the Alaska Wildland Support Module out of Joint Base Elmendorf. So they were actually using those tools in the 2019 fire season. So everything you see in the case, the tractor plow, those were all things that were actually used by wildland firefighters in support of the Air Force. So we had these two photos that we had used already. We'd pulled them off of DVIDs and it and turned out it's Tractor 53. Photos that we just randomly chose to use were actually of our artifact, which was really cool. The story is the rescue of soccer players, kids, and their coach. And they went poking around in a cave, which a lot of people do. It's a national park in Thailand. They just went at the wrong time. And uh, a lot, a lot of rain came down and they were far enough back in this cave system that the caves filled up with water and they were not able to, um, to exit to safety. And we knew we wanted to highlight that story. We had hosted Kenneth O'Brien and um, Tech Sergeant O'Brien had come to the museum a couple of years earlier, fresh from the event itself, had given a lecture and spoken to uh, staff and the public about uh, the rescue operation and his involvement in it. And I had seen that. We uh, knew we wanted that to be a part of our story. This is the mouth of the cave. Uh, these are the children's bikes, and that's how they confirmed that they had went in there. Um, luckily, this is a one-way-in, one-way-out kind of cave. Um, otherwise, I don't think we would have ever found them. Also, there was probably better ways to get in there, but we didn't know because of the water. And so it probably wasn't all that hard for them to get back there. Um, and then apparently, the water started rising, and they couldn't get out the way they came, so they tried to go further in, 
Um, but then they got trapped. So I think that's how they got that far back. The wetsuit was there. He actually wore that. It still, um, as we worked with it, it still has dust and residue, dirt, you know, um, from Thailand, from the cave refuge. He hasn't worn it since. Same with um, headgear and uh, um, gloves and, and footgear and all of that. And so then the task began, um, you know, how to capture that so that people seeing the exhibit um, and seeing that portion of the exhibit get a sense for what it was like. Go, 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 go. We have an interactive game that, while very fun, even though I'm not very good at it, but it gives you just a little bit of an opportunity to see all the different factors that are involved. Gaming divers are making their way through this cave system. Kenny O'Brien was instrumental uh, in the development of our search and rescue section. He also helped with our wing boat that we have on display as well, offering advice on you know, how to properly tend to it, uh, mend it when we need to, and conserve all the items properly. So it was really, it was a really good experience having him here, hearing his stories and uh, what AFSOC as a whole does. It was very enlightening. We talked to the 910th out in Youngstown and we asked them, can you give us some guidance on how to build these bundles to resemble what you would drop during a humanitarian airlift mission? This is what's called a container delivery system. And what you see here composes, is, is composed of a lot of things, starting with this piece of four by four plywood on the floor that all of the rigging, they call this tapestry, that is connected up through the holes and connects to the harness. The harness is laid down on top of the honeycomb that this is designed to absorb the impact when the CDS bundle lands on the ground. And then um, the harness is laid down and then this coating here, this uh, nylon is called the bag that's laid on top of the harness. And all of the contents of the CDS bundle are then stacked up and captured inside of this bag as well as we can. And this is pretty much a cube of MRE boxes. There are 40 MRE boxes in here roughly. Then the, on top of this is a piece of plywood to help secure the parachute. So that the parachute, the weight of it doesn't collapse anything below here. It helps to spread, it's like shoring. They actually assembled the three airdrop pallets that you see in the exhibit. And so when they had the first one completed, they actually flew it down with their commander, with their PA folks, with I think 22 people from their wing. And we were able to tour them, we were able to show them the designs for the exhibit, we were able to say, look, this is where your story is gonna fit in. And so that was really cool. Throughout the Air Force, every single organization, every single person, every single community we talked to was so excited to be a part of this. So they were just, Having their story being told, that just, even just having sign text for a lot of these people, that was huge for them. So for them to be able to come in to see these tools that they use every single day doing their jobs, I think speaks so much to them because they know exactly, they know what that piece of equipment is for, they know what that gear is used to do. So for them to see it here with their adjacent stories being told, I think is really cool and really important for them. happened that I had been speaking with the commander of this unit who actually flies Operation Deep Freeze missions. So they're flying their C-17s from Lewis McCord to New Zealand to Antarctica. So we were trying to get gear from them showing the deep freeze story because that's another one. Penguins in the Air Force. What does that mean? You'll find out in our exhibit. And so he was like, yeah, we have our C-17 demo team is flying down for the air show. I can just load up a flight bag with the gear and someone can bring it to you. So Sarah and I got to go to the flight line. We totally crashed a CAP event because the C-17 crew was flying in to then talk to these CAP cadets 
So we're just hanging out in this room with 150 cat kids just waiting for this person that we never met before, had no idea what they looked like, who they were, just to bring us a flight bag of gear. And so that was just a cool, like, you know, we'll be in the neighborhood. We can meet up while we're there. The Helams, or hard side expandable light air mobile station, is sometimes used around the world to essentially create a temporary structure that we can use on a base or in the field as kind of a, a temporary shelter. In humanitarian missions, they are typically used for communication systems. Um, that's how ours is equipped. Um, and ours, you can walk through, was over in Liberia during the Ebola uh, epidemic among a few other missions that it also participated in that were all humanitarian specific. When visitors go inside, they'll see mostly fully equipped server rack uh, communication system, everything that we're allowed to show. And they can also find stories inside uh, various case studies, if you will, of different humanitarian missions where we either airlifted goods or airlifted people. Our new friends at the 7-Eleven, part of uh, you staff Sam, they were wonderful. They said, absolutely. Um, they're largely responsible for all of the equipment, all uh, right down to the, the tubes and the wires and the power cords. They're responsible for donating those items. We have a whole sort of diorama, a scene um, to kind of recreate and give visitors a sense of what a um, both a critical care and an aeromedical evac situation would be like on our C-130, which is an aircraft that they use a lot in the work that they do. Our critical care and our aeromedical evac people, I mean, they are literally saving lives at 30,000 feet. They're operating what amounts to an emergency room. To build such um, wonderful relationships with these people, um, it's nice to see them then represented, represented in, in mannequin form to ensure, again, that high level of fidelity, that, that off, uh, authenticity, that realism. What you're looking at is, is very real, right down to uh, the people that the mannequins represent. We were working with some folks from the uh, uh, Surgeon General's office out of the Air Mobility Command who were very instrumental in um, getting us a transport isolation system, uh, which is a big giant artifact that is featured in the exhibit. And they actually came out and spent a few days with us assembling it. This is no small task. It's quite, a, uh, quite an item. What they didn't know how to do was how to put together all the um, aeromedical evac and critical care equipment that was going inside the TIS, as we call it. To, um, to create another scene. We envisioned putting a mannequin in there to tell that story inside of the, the work that the TIS does and how what you're able to do inside that TIS. And they kind of, you know, they kind of looked at us and said, well, that's not really what we do. And we all scratched our heads and they said, hey, the 445th is right here. We work with them all the time. I'll just give them a call and see if maybe there's some folks that could come over and help. And the next day they were here. And they spent a day with us assembling that equipment, telling us a little bit about what they do. And it was all because we had this relationship already with the Air Mobility Command folks. They work with the 445th. And they're right in our backyards. Who would have thought? It was like the whole kind of came full circle. It was, it was wonderful. One of the things that was really interesting about this exhibit is when you think of Air Force humanitarian missions, you have the broad strokes that you think about. You think about Katrina, you think about the earthquake in Haiti, you think about the Thai cave rescue. And these are all fairly contemporary stories. The problem was we didn't have any artifacts that spoke to any of these stories. So being contemporary, a lot of these people, they're still active duty, or if they're not active duty, they're still in the civilian service after retiring. So that made it kind of easy to track down a lot of these people. Um, you just look up their name in the global. So um, Pauline Lucas is a great example. We found photos of her from 2005, 2007 time period. And it said, you know, public health officer, Pauline Lucas. So I go into the global, search in Pauline Lucas. I find an employee with a 7-Eleven here at Wright Pat. She's a public health officer. So I'm like, how many Pauline Lucases can there be in the Air Force? 
how many Pauline Lucases can there be in the Air Force who are public health officers? So I just sent her an email, said, hey, I found this press release, you were named in it, are you the same Pauline Lucas? And she was, and we ended up meeting with her two or three times, she did an interview for the exhibit, she was right here in our backyard, all because I just looked her up, like, let's just see if we can find her. I think her story is really interesting because it shows the careful thought and planning that goes into these missions and how we try very consciously to not only do good, but to do the best good we can, to be most effective um, and to make sure that it's not just a one day assist, but that we're building sustainability into the humanitarian missions that we execute so that they can continue to foster good and strengthen communities around the world for decades to come.